Good morning. I am, I'm glad to be back. It's, it's been a couple weeks since I've gotten to preach to you guys, but I, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be here, and I am struck this morning uh, afresh, I don't know why, by uh, the, the singing is, is a joy to be here, and uh, both Drew and Kirk did a phenomenal job picking out songs. I, uh, you can ask Leah afterwards. I, Kirk put this first song up there, and I was like, oh, that was a, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. And, uh, Yes. So I, I'm very, I'm very pleased to be here and to have, uh, to to be part of, of such a wonderful congregation and to have lots of people who are good at singing and, and good at and putting together song services. So anyway, if you will, turn to the 140th Psalm, Psalm 140. We're going to read it in its entirety, and then we're going to talk about it. Psalm 140. says, Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from the violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. The arrogant have hidden trap for me, and with their cords they have spread a net. Beside the way they have set snares for me. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear to the voice of my pleas for mercy, O Lord. O Lord, my God, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not O Lord, the desires of the wicked, do not further their evil plot, or they will be exalted. As for the head of those who surround me, let the mischief of their lips overwhelm them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into miry pits no more to rise. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent man speedily. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. So, summarizing this psalm, we see a guy who's in trouble, David. He cries out, God, don't let the evil man win. And then he says something that kind of shocks our modern conscience. He says in verse 9, As for the head of those who surround me, let mischief of their lips overwhelm them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into miry pits, no more to rise. So he says, God, throw some fire down on them. Drown them in a pit. And this is um, is a little bit shocking. And so we, we read a psalm like this, and we wonder, what do we do with these psalms. These are called imprecatory psalms. This one is kind of uh, a minor one. Uh, but still, this sense of asking God to call down fire on somebody, it seems a little bit odd. I'm, a, I'm uncomfortable praying that way. And so we're going to look at a few more of these psalms and we'll ask ourselves, what do we do with these? So if you will, turn over to Psalm 109. Psalm 109, here we get, and I'll only read an excerpt from this, but an even more shocking, I think, uh, imprecation, if that's a word. Psalm 109, starting in verse 6. So he's talking about this evil man who's opposed to him, and he says, Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May others take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander around and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruit of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. Let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may be cut off, sorry, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. He says, God, throw the book at him. You know, get an accuser against him, get him guilty, kill him, and may his children be orphans and may they not be given any mercy. Like, this is, this is pretty rough. Or uh, I'll give you one more example. This one I put on the board. 
Simply, David says, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them as enemies. So, we are continuing this, serv- this series that Jacob began of letting my soul sing. And we've been discussing the Psalms. We've been talking about cry- deep cries to God from the Psalms. And we've talked about thanksgiving and praise and uh, you know, cries of, of lamentation or deliverance. But I have uh, the difficult task of talking about these imprecatory psalms. What do we do with them? Uh, are we supposed to pray them? Are we not supposed to? What's, what's the deal? So I'm going to structure this one slightly differently than I normally would do these letting my soul sing because, well, when you read a psalm that's like, praise God, you're like, all right, cool. I know how to do that. I can just pray, praise God. Like, it's, it's not that complicated to make the transition from this is what the psalm says to this is what we do. But this one takes a little bit of explaining, and so uh, I'm going to talk first about the context into which we put these psalms, and that is the context of the battle between good and evil. I'm going to spend a little bit of time setting that up, then placing these psalms into context, and then I think we'll be able to understand more conceptually what these are about and what they mean for us today. So if you will be turning over to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, and I'm going to put up, a, board, uh, put up a, a passage on the board that's from later on in Deuteronomy. So, as I said, these psalms come in the context of the battle between good and evil. Let not the evil man win. Stop evil and let good win. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, we get this text. It says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind... He fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So the message of this is that there are multiple nations. You know, you've got the Amalekites, you've got the Philistines, you've got all these nations. And God put his seal on one nation, Israel, that's my people. And you've got Asherah, and you've got Baal, and you've got all these other, you know, evil spiritual forces out in the world. And they've got control of these other nations, but God's nation is his people, Israel. And so we read in Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hibites, and the Jebusites— Seven nations more numerous and mighty than you. When the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for you would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash into pieces their pillars, chop down their asher and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So we get this idea. God's people are Israel. And Israel represents God in the world. And there are all these other nations representing other gods in the world. But we serve the one true and living God. And so we are fighting, in some ways, against all of these other nations and the other nations' gods. But this battle takes place on physical grounds. Like, actually, they're fighting over the land of Canaan. And so God brings a physical battle into play. So God, they're fighting the bad guys in, with you know, flesh and blood and swords and, and that sort of thing. And that's what this battle between good and evil looks like. Because these people, these evil people, represent the force of evil in the world. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people that come out of this. Obviously, you've got people like Ruth. You've got people like, I mean, the Egyptians that came with them in the mixed multitude out of Egypt. You've got lots of people that came and joined the people of Israel. Uh, the Gibeonites even, in some senses. Um, And yet, by and large, the story is God's people versus everyone else. 
And these people who are opposed to God's people are opposed to God himself. It is a battle of good and evil. And it is fought on physical grounds, national lines. And this battle of God's people versus all the other people in the world, it, it sort of changes as you go throughout the course of the Bible. And it becomes less about physical lines and more about spiritual lines. Turn with me to a book that you probably don't go to very often. We're going to Zechariah chapter 9. Because there are two passages in Zechariah 9 that are really sort of fascinating as they show the transition that occurs in this battle between good and evil. So in Zechariah chapter 9, uh, the first half of this chapter, uh, it, he's talking about how he's, God is going to uh, break out and attack uh, some of these other nations, and he specifically targets Tyre. And in verse 4 of Zechariah chapter 9, it says, But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions, strike down her power on the sea, and she shall be devoured by fire. This is going to be a big thing, and the other nations are going to see it. So picking up in verse 5. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid. Gaza too, and they shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also, because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon will be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth, and its abominations from between its teeth, it too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. This is a fascinating text, okay? Because God breaks out in, in judgment on Tyre, but then he says the Philistines, Gaza and Ashdod and Ekron, all of these Philistine cities, they're going to watch this. But instead of God coming and destroying the Philistines, which is maybe what you would expect, what happens instead is in verse 7, I will take away the blood from its mouth and its abominations between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah. Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Now you've got to understand two things about this. One is that obviously blood and abominations are, are bad. These are the kinds of things that would defile the children of Israel. The second thing you need to know is that the Jebusites, much like the Gibeonites, uh, were inhabitants of Canaan, but rather than being wiped out, they were incorporated into the people of God. And so what Zechariah is laying the foundation here for is the idea that rather than holy warfare killing off the Philistines, instead... God is going to bring the Philistines, incorporate them into God's people, give them the same sort of purity standards that purified and uh, sanctified the people of Israel. God is going to make the Philistines his people as well. And this goes along with some things that Zechariah has already said, just a few verses earlier in Zechariah chapter 8, uh, verse 23. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That in this day of the Lord, something is going to happen. That all the people of the earth, all the nations are going to be streaming to God. And that there's going to be a transformation that happens. That these other nations are going to be sort of incorporated into the people of God. And so we already we've got the foundation laid for Things like Pentecost and uh, you know, Ephesians chapter 2, where the, you know, the boundary is broken between Jew and Gentile, that people are brought together. What we're seeing clearly is that the national divide of good and evil, this physical divide, is much less clear. Now here's the second text I said that we should check out in Zechariah chapter 9. And I just sort of summarize it for you. This is Zechariah 9, uh, verses 9 through 13. It begins, uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And obviously we recognize this as being the text about the triumphal entrance. But... What's really wild about this text is that it does not parallel that in clear ways at all. The rest of the next few verses here have the idea that God is going to cut off all the war implements from his people. And then he is going to pick up his people and transform them into a weapon. 
It says in verse 13, For I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. That this king rolls in, takes his people, transforms them into a weapon, and defeats the Greeks with them. That's the story. Now, this, is, this text is very odd in several ways, which is good for us because it helps us to connect it to something that happens in the New Testament. So in John's account of the triumphal entrance, after Jesus enters, and it quotes this text, Zechariah chapter 9, then we get Jesus interacting with some Greeks. Now, if you, which is very odd, because Greeks don't show up a lot in the Old Testament. They don't show up a lot in the Gospels. And so the fact that these would be a coincidence, it would be very strange. So I think that we're intended to connect these. And so based on this text, what we should expect is that the followers of Jesus are going to be a weapon and that they're going to defeat the Greeks. But what we read instead is in John chapter 12, verse 20. It says, Now among those who went up to the, fe- to the worship of the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servants. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Rather than turning his people into a weapon to destroy these Greeks, what we see is Jesus telling them, I am going to die. I am going to die so that as a seed grows and makes more seeds and makes a way, I will be, you know, the, this is it's kind of laying the groundwork for Jesus being the, the firstborn from the grave, that we can all find resurrection through Christ. Jesus isn't coming to destroy the Greeks. He's coming to rescue them. And he's not turning his people into a weapon. He's turning his people into people just like him, humble, self-sacrificing. And this is a very odd message, a very strange way that this text gets transformed. But it, it serves well to make this point. The battle between good and evil changes dramatically through Jesus and the cross. In the Old Testament, it was fought on national lines. Good versus evil was Israel versus Ashdod, Israel versus the Amalekites. Now, the battle between good and evil is not fought on physical bounds. It is instead fought in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is, sorry, when your obedience is complete. This idea that we are not fighting a physical war. We are fighting a warfare that is here to honor God. It's here to destroy the arguments of the evil people. As we continue on in Ephesians, we're told we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What he's saying here is that we're not fighting a physical battle anymore. This is a spiritual battle. And it's not just like physical versus mental. No, this is a spiritual battle in the sense of an otherworldly sort of battle. We are fighting the spiritual, the cosmic powers of the present darkness. We are fighting spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is the, these are the people that are doing battle against us, trying to, you know, that's why we need the armor of God, that they're trying to destroy us. And in the same way, that is the fight that we are fighting presently. Not a battle fought on national lines, not I'm good, you're evil, but rather there are evil forces in this world. And our job as God's soldiers, is to go forth with the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, and rescue people from the domain of darkness. We don't come to slay people, we're coming to save them, but because Jesus sent us to do that. And so, while in the Old Testament, battle of good and evil is people versus other people, physical versus physical, now it's a spiritual battle. Now, instead of destroying the enemy, we're here to rescue them. We are here to deliver them so that God might be glorified. So, 
We haven't talked about imprecatory psalms in a while, so let's pick that back up here. Where does that go in this storyline? Well, what we see is that in the Old Testament, we were fighting a very physical battle. And so we prayed very physical things. God, throw fire down on them. Destroy them. But it was in this context of the battle between good and evil. As it, the first verse of Psalm 140, the one that we read at the beginning, is effectively saying, God, bad people are doing bad things to me. Don't let evil win. This is a battle of good and evil. And he's saying, God, we are being defeated. Step in and rescue us. This is always about good and evil. It's always about God rescuing us. This isn't about a personal vendetta. This is not, you know, oh, that my neighbor, you know, his, his hedge is over my property, so, you know, strike him dead. No, this is about evil is winning. Don't let them win. God, execute justice according to your promises. And promises are critical because I'm going to show you probably more texts than I need to, uh, that show that a lot of these imprecatory psalms are based on things that God has already promised or something that God has already said or revealed about himself. I'll show you. So, for example, Psalm 35 says, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. But in Isaiah, we're told, For I contend with those who contend with you. I will save your children. So this is a psalm saying, God, fight my enemies like you said that you were going to. Psalm 35 again. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Jeremiah 23. Therefore their way shall be to them like a slippery path in the darkness into which they shall be driven and fall. God, do what you said you were going to do. Fight bad like you said you were going to. Um, uh, Psalm 11. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. But raining fire and sulfur is what God already did in Sodom and Gomorrah. What God already did when, uh, or already promised in the battle of Gog and Magog. Like, this is something that God has said. This is something God has revealed. This is how God defeats his enemies, with fire and brimstone, because that's, that's something that we know about him. And so they say, God, do what you do. Psalm 12, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Well, we know from Proverbs 6 that there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And so it makes sense that if there are flattering lips and tongues making great boasts, that God should cut them off because those are things that God hates. This is something I know about God, and so I'm asking God, be according to who you are. Psalm 55, let death steal over them, let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their hearts. This is something that God has already done in the Korah incident, that uh, the, if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens up its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. This is something that God has already done. We're saying, God, be according to who you have revealed yourself to be. We're told, we ask God to blot out Bought them out from the book of the living, which is something God already said in Exodus 32, that whoever sins against me, I'll blot out of my book. And lastly, this is, I think, the most dramatic. Uh, it says, blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. But this is already something that God said he was going to do in Isaiah 13. The oracle concerning Babylon, which is what Isaiah 137 is, or Psalm 137 is about, Oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw, their infants shall be dashed into pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. This is something God said he was going to do. And so these imprecatory psalms are not psalms of personal vengeance. They're not, I really hate that guy. It's God. There's a battle going on right now, and evil is winning. Do what you said you were going to do. Let justice prevail. Let evil be punished. Let evil be stopped. God, break in, rescue the good, let you be glorified. And so with that in mind, I want to read two of these imprecatory psalms, two more. We're going to Psalm 141. We read Psalm 140, Psalm 141. Because this is a psalm study after all. Psalm 141. It says, O Lord, I'll wait, <laughs> Psalm 141 says, O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands at the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in the company of men who work iniquity, and let me not eat 
of their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. When their judges are thrown over the cliff, then they will hear my word, for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. But my eyes are towards you, O God, my Lord. In you I seek refuge. Let me not, uh, leave me not defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and from the snares of evildoers. Let the wicked man fall into their own nets while I pass by. This is the point that says, God, I'm trying to live a righteous life here. And if someone were coming to me and rebuking me, you know, beating me so that I could get better, so that I can improve, like, that would be a blessing to me. But that's not what's happening. Instead, evil men are defeating me, and they're just doing it spitefully. And God, I need you to break in here, rescue me. And these nets that they're laying for me, let me escape them, let them fall into their own nets. God, give them a piece of their own medicine so that evil is defeated, so evil is stopped, and that good wins. Psalm 149 is the other one we're going to look at. And I, I like this psalm a lot because it, uh, it takes a really sharp turn right in the middle. So one, Psalm 149 says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and the two-edged sword in their hands to execute judgment on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. This is a song about praising God. It's a song about bringing glory to God. And right in the middle, he says, you know what would be great? Is if I could be the one to carry the sword. If I could be the one to, to bind them with, with chains of iron. Because I, I want to be involved in what God is doing. God is defeating evil. And it would be a blessing to be involved in this battle. Because that's what it is. It's, it's a battle for God's glory. It's a battle of good and evil. It's not about vengeance. It's not about vendettas. It's about good and evil, and that's all that it's about. And so as we begin to ask ourselves, okay, what does the battle of good and evil look like now? Again, it's not a battle on physical lines. And these imprecatory psalms are not to tell us to, you know, get really angry at our neighbor and then ask God to smite them. Instead, these are psalms about good and evil. And in the same way, we need to be praying that evil is defeated and that good wins. But those prayers look different for us. And so that brings us then to the second point, is should we pray this way? And I'm going to say yes, but with a, a big star. I, I think we need to find an equivalent to these kinds of prayers. And I think equivalent is important, one, because I just spent this whole first point talking about how things have changed. But if you don't take my word for it, or maybe you zoned out, Jesus says simply, you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or Romans 12, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. That while in the Old Testament, calling down fire and, and that kind of thing, like that was something that they did because the battle was physical. Now it's different. Now we are not calling down fire on anybody. You know, that's what Jesus tells his disciples. James and John are like, dude, this, this Samaritan town, they, they weren't going to let us in, so let's call down fire on them. And Jesus says, no, don't do that. And Peter, you know, he picks up a sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear, and Jesus picks the, the ear up. He says, no, this is not the kind of battle we're fighting. We are not a people of vengeance. We are not to curse people. We are not to crusade or conquest or jihad anybody. This is about God winning. It's about good winning. And the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's a battle against spiritual forces. It's a battle of rescuing people out of the power of darkness. It's about God being glorified. So, I want to then look at three texts which are not very, not really imprecatory in the sense of God smite, the, smite these people, but they are very much in the spirit of may good win let evil be stopped. So we're going to go to these three texts. The first one of them 
is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here Paul prays, or not necessarily prays, but asks of the people of Corinth to do something that seems a little bit uh, dramatic. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Start in verse 1. It says, It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit. And if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who, do, who did such a thing. When you are assembled, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Did you catch that? Verse 5. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is something that Paul prays. This is in the New Testament. What do we do with this text? What does it mean, and how does it fit into the battle of good and evil? Well, I think that what we need to recognize here is that there is evil in the midst of God's people here. And while in the Old Testament, you purge the evil from your midst by, like, stoning this person, what we see Paul doing, what we see Paul saying in verse 2, is, let him who has done this be removed from among you. And I think that gives us commentary on verse 5, deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That... There's a twofold thing that Paul wants them to do. First, get this guy out from among you because his, his influence is poisoning you. You have evil among you, and you guys are not addressing this sin the way you're supposed to. You know, uh, Matthew 18, where if your brother sins, go to him and talk to him. These people are aware that this man has his father's wife, and they're not doing anything about it. They're, in fact, uh, reveling in this obnoxious sin. And Paul says, you got to stop. you got to get this evil out from among you. But what he says is critical at the end of this. Deliver him to Satan, which I think means, uh, you know, he's, he's in the, you know, the, the saved group right now. But you gotta, you gotta push him out because he's, he's not bearing the name of Christ. He doesn't have God dwelling in him. This, he's not, he, he is at fault and he is sinning in a way that separates him from God. But on earth, you guys have him among you. He doesn't recognize the, the gravity of what he has done. And so he still feels all right. And you guys need to cast him out from your midst, deliver him to you know, the domain of Satan, so that he understands the gravity of what he has done. But the goal of all of this is not just to you know, save the church and remove his filthy influence, but rather so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That when he is cast out from among you, when he is in the domain of Satan, he's going to recognize the gravity of what his sin has cost him. And in so doing, in you know, causing this man some short amount of pain, we, the hope is that his soul can be rescued in the day of the Lord. And so this is effectively about someone who is in sin coming to, into uh, contact with the effects of their sin and that driving them to make a change. And that is a very biblical New Testament thing that we can be praying today. I've heard people uh, pray about you know, people who have fallen away or uh, people out there in the world who are just blatantly sinning. And I've heard them pray something along the lines of, God, you know, make their life uncomfortable. Help them to recognize how much they need you, how much they're missing out, and help them to be restless in seeking you because they're missing you and help them to realize that. And I think that is exactly in line with this imprecatory psalm, in line with this uh, battle of good and evil, in line with what Paul is doing here. That we can wish for physical harm to people or discomfort if the goal is for their soul to be saved. And that's what Paul is asking for, that his soul could be saved. And so should we pray this way? No, we shouldn't be asking God to you know, throw fire down on people. But we should be asking God to do what needs to happen, even if that makes people uncomfortable, to bring people back to God, to bring people into an awareness of their sins so that they repent and change and come to God. So that's the first one. The second one is in the book of Jude. We are uh, really hitting the highlights here with Zechariah and Jude. Uh, Jude 
in Jude, there's a pretty serious situation going on. There are some people among them that are not good for the church. In verse 4, he says, Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were destined for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God, our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. He further describes them, starting in verse 12. These are hidden reefs at your love feast. They are, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam in their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. He says, these people are bad news. Okay, they crept in unnoticed, which is already not good. They're seeking to, they're perverting the grace of our God into sensuality, denying our only master, he calls them wandering stars. You know, if you're at, at sea and you're trying to, you know, figure out which way is north and you're following a wandering star, you're going to get lost. He calls them, you know, hidden reefs in your love feast. That these people are going to lead to destruction. There is, this is bad news that these people are here. But while in the Old Testament we might read, you know, so stab him through the heart, what we, what we don't see is that at all. Rather, what we see Jude encouraging the people to do begins in verse 17. He says, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by their flesh. So what we don't read is take vengeance on these people. You know, wipe them out by whatever means necessary. Because we understand that vengeance is for God. That judgment is Coming to these people, as it says in verse 4, they are designated for this condemnation. That there is a judgment coming, but it is not going to be our judgment. Instead, rather than destroying these false teachers, destroying these people who are having a deleterious effect in our congregation, what we need to do is first remember in verse 17 that the apostles told you this is going to happen. There are going to be people and they are going to cause a mess in your church and you need to know this is going to happen. That this is already predicted. This isn't, you know, thwarting God's plans. He knew it was going to happen. So, just hold on. Next, we're told in much the same way that uh, Jesus tells Peter when he asks, when Peter says, hey, so, so what's going to happen with John? Jesus says, Peter, I want you to do what Peter is supposed to do. <laughs> and in the same way, he says, you know, they're, they're going to do their thing. They're going to do evil things. But here's what you do. Verse 20. You, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. He says they're going to be people and they're going to do terrible things. But you don't let them turn you from the path of God. You do what you're supposed to do. And then, in verses 22 and 23, having mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by their flesh. Additionally, you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do, but also, there are people, and they're in trouble. There are doubters. There are people who are being swept away by these, you know, hidden reef, these, these wandering stars. And you've got to watch out. You've got to help them. You've got to save those. Have mercy on them. And snatch them out of the fire, hating even the garment stained by their flesh. This might seem a little bit odd, but this is also a reference back to Zechariah chapter 3, uh, where uh, Joshua is standing representing the people of God, and he's got this filthy garment. And Satan is like, God, throw out your people. They're full of sin. And yet God has an angel come, and he takes away the filthy garment, and he puts on a clean garment, and thus God cleanses the people. In the same way, when we were stuck in sin, we were wearing this defiled, sinful garment. 
And these people out in the world, they are full of this you know, defiling influence of sin. And when we snatch them out of the fire, we got to hate the sin, but we got to rescue the sinner. we got to pull them out from the fire, rescue them from the power of the evil one. Because remember, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. And we are rescuing those in darkness from the grip of Satan, from the effect of evil, into God's grace. That is our task. And so they're going to be people, and they're going to cause trouble. And we need to watch out for them. And we need to do what we can to perform damage control, to rescue the people who are being injured by them. But what we are not going to do is curse them. What we are not going to do is try and call down fire on them. What instead we are going to do is wait for God to do what God does. Let God take care of these people and pray while we can that their evil effects would not hurt this church. We get a similar sort of text, and we won't turn and read this, but in uh, Galatians chapter 5, what, maybe the one case that, I don't know, you guys who are like, he's saying we shouldn't pray imprecatorily. What about uh, Galatians? So in Galatians, Paul is addressing this uh, issue of these false teachers who are coming in, Judaizing teachers, who are telling the Christians they need to be, the, Jew, the Gentiles, that they need to be circumcised to become Jews. And Paul says, I, wi- I wish that those who trouble you would emasculate themselves. You know, they'll, you know if they're going to circumcise themselves, I wish to just go all the way. And that uh, is a little bit startling. But I think, it's, I think Paul's intent there is sarcastic. I don't think he's actually intending God to strike this on these people. I think what he's instead saying is that he is angry. He is frustrated, and I think rightly so, at the danger, at the trouble that these false teachers are causing. And I think that that anger is right. That ire is proper. But it is not our place to fight the evil people. It is not our place to destroy them. Instead, it is our task to rescue those who are caught in darkness, to be God's hands, to help those who are weak, Encourage the faint-hearted. That is our task, to fight against the evil people. Not, to, not with swords, but with kindness, with love, with mercy. So, those are two texts. Now, let's turn to the last one. And this one is uh, of a sort of different variety. This one is in first, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And I am not at all going to intend to uh, expound the entirety of Second Thessalonians 2 because there are many parts of this that baffle me. However, I think this gives us a key, an insight into this spiritual battle that's going on. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, starting in verse 1, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do not, uh, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so until he is out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deceptions for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends on them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, the battle between good and evil is not the hammer with which I intend to hit every nail in this text, but I do think that several things in this text well into this idea. He says, look, there is an evil one, the son of lawlessness, and he is currently restrained, but he's going to get out, and then Jesus is going to slay him with the, with the breath of his mouth. Now, I don't know what all of that means, but here's what I do know. This is a spiritual battle taking place in spiritual ways, and we are praying 
that good may win, that evil may be defeated, that God may be glorified. And if we're praying that kind of prayer, then we can also pray, God, whenever this happens, however this is going to happen, may you win. Just like you say that you're going to. May the breath of your mouth extinguish the evil one. May he who is restraining him, restrain him. Like, may you win. May evil be defeated. May the evil be bound in the way that God wants it to be. And so, as we step away, what, what are we praying about? We are praying, we are crying out to God, stop evil. Don't let evil win. And that looks like people out in the world who are defiling influences, people who are trying to oppose us, people who are persecuting us. It takes a lot of forms. But our cry is not for God to slay them, but for God to rescue them, and if they will not listen to God's call for rescue, that God would keep them from defiling his people. And so with that, let's return to Psalm 140, where we began. And I want to look at a few of these verses and, uh, you know, kind of contextualize them for us. Psalm 140, in verses 1 and 2, it says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. This is asking God, God, evil people are fighting me, and I need you to make them stop, thwart their evil plans. Don't let evil people stop us. And in the same way, the apostles pray this way. Like in Acts chapter 4, after, you know, they've been imprisoned, they pray for boldness. And they say, God, there are a lot of evil forces against us. You know, Herod and, and all of these, these sad, like, the, the bad guys are fighting us. And if we are not careful, if we don't have boldness, they're going to stop the spread of the gospel. And we don't want that, God. So whatever happens, give us the strength to carry the gospel. Don't let the forces of evil win. Don't let them thwart your plan. And this is the same thing that Paul tells us to pray for in 2 Timothy. That we pray that the government may let us leave, uh, live you know, peaceable, quiet and peaceable lives. That we would not be infringed on are worshiping God by the government. And if so, that we would continue to have the boldness that we need to, to keep going. That the gospel would not be stopped. That evil would not win. And as we continue in Psalm 140, we read what, you know, caused us trouble at the beginning. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into the miry pits, no more to rise. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let the evil hunt down the violent man speedily. We're asking that evil be destroyed. And in the same way, we can pray that today. I mean, we, we're told in Romans chapter 16 that God is going to take his people and they are going to trample Satan underfoot. We read about the man of lawlessness that is being restrained, but that Jesus is going to destroy. We read in Revelation that God is going to throw death and Hades into the lake of fire. We read again in Revelation, but also in Daniel, that the evil beasts that represent the nations of this world are going to be defeated, destroyed, shattered, and just totally obliterated. And we can pray, knowing that that's what God is going to do still, that that be a success. That evil be destroyed. That good may win. That is our request. That is our cry. That God be glorified. That good may win. That evil the powers of evil in this world would not succeed. And so, if you're here this morning, and you're hearing about this battle of good and evil, and you're like, you know, I, I've been on the wrong side of this. I, I, I haven't been striving for the faith. I haven't been seeking to serve God. I haven't been glorifying him in my life. Then we would love to help you. If we need to pray, for, pray with you, talk with you, we would love to help you with that. Or if you've never begun this journey. You've never declared, I, I want to serve God. I want to be on the side of good. I want to be God's people. Then we'd love to tell you about the message of God, so that you can believe the truth of the, this good message, that you can turn from your sins, that you can confess that Jesus is Lord, King of our life, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and walk to rise in newness of life. If we could help you, we would love to do so as we stand and sing. those